right. Um, well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're here with the, the former mayor of Vancouver, Sam Sullivan. Thank you very much for, for uh, taking the time to speak with us, Sam. Um, yeah, which, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of the, the viewers at home are, are familiar with, with who you are, but uh, for those who aren't, are you maybe give a brief in introduction of yourself? Sam Sullivan. Um, Yes, I was mayor for a little while and also city councillor and I was MLA for a while and very briefly a cabinet minister. So I've done that whole thing. Um, but I, I mainly um, got involved uh, in my beginning of my career uh, involved with charities, nonprofit societies, uh, helping people with disabilities. And uh, so that's pretty much my, my life. Mm -hmm. How did, how did you get interested in politics? What, what, can you take us through kind of your, your journey as a, as a politician? Well, I was mostly involved in helping create quality of life opportunities for disabled people. And uh, quite often we would bump up against uh, municipal bylaws and things. So, you know, it sort of, I found myself being drawn into that. And so I got involved and got elected for some, some reason and uh, kept getting elected. So. And then if you hang around uh, City Hall long enough, they make you the mayor. And so <laughs> I did that for a while. And, and then uh, when I retired from City Hall, or as my mother helpfully reminds me when I was thrown out of City Hall, I uh, decided to uh, get involved in, uh, you started another charity, uh, Global Civics Policy Society, and uh, very interested in history, you know, trying to understand where we sit uh, where we are on the trajectory of life and uh, you know as Winston Churchill says the further back you look the farther forward you see I found it uh, fascinating to try to um, understand where we are as a society. Now was your interest in history is that something that came came to you later in life or have you always been interested in history when, when you were in school was that something that you you really took to or, or, or yeah can you take us through kind of your, your uh, the development of your passion for, for history? Well, my, my interest in history has nothing to do with the past. Uh, it's to do with the future. You know, I want to know uh, what the opportunities, the possibilities are. You know, I, I realized when I was mayor that, um, you know, I sort of got into the seat of power and realized when I got there, that's not where the power was. You know, that we are really, uh, you know, captured by philosophers and uh, thinkers uh, from previous generations and, uh, and path-dependent kind of activities that have been, um, you know, part of our past. And that really does determine what we can do, you know. So uh, I realized that it's actually outside of the, you know, formal power is where the power is. Okay. Um. You've got several projects that you're working on. You're a busy guy, let's face it. Um, one of them is the uh, Vancouver uh, City uh, Council Meeting Archives. That you mm -hmm. brought some people together and you're uh, going through the process. And actually, I looked at some of the original notes, the, the uh, minutes, and I, I have to you know, put my hand out to all the people that are digitizing these because some of those are pretty hard to read. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what, what brought, brought about this project and uh, how, yeah. how, where do you see it going? Well, that was part of my uh, search to try to find where, where is the power and where is the direction of society. And uh, I thought by looking at the very first council, I would get some clues as to what it was all about, you know, when you strip back the onion and you get back to the very <coughs> initial, um, you know, um, so should I do that again? <laughs> should I? Yeah. Well, that's, it's really sure. dry in here, it's really dry in here and I have allergies. That's all right. Oh, it's the time of year. Yeah, sorry, oh. sorry. Okay. Can yeah, you can, you can just start can, again. You can edit, edit right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we can edit it. Yeah. Okay, so, mm -hmm. Your question, yeah, was the... Uh, well, why don't you, why don't you okay. start again, just maybe ask oh, the question okay. again. Yeah, yeah. And 
Um, Sam, you're involved in quite a few different uh, projects, uh, charities. Uh, you're a busy guy. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is the digitization of the, uh, the minutes for the Vancouver City Council from the 18, well, before 1900. And um, I've looked at some of the work that's been done on that, and it's impressive. And, you, you know, mm -hmm. all the people you've got working on that really deserve a call out, and congratulations. What got you involved in that? What, what brought that mm -hmm. idea to, to the fore for you? Yes, yeah, so when I was doing my, uh, my research into what city council was all about, I thought if I could peel back the layers of history and get right to the very beginning, it would give me some clues as to what it was all about. And, and I'd also be able to see the, the factions that, that uh, organized in, in you know, electoral uh, warfare. And um, so I was able to do that, and I went back and I, I looked, uh, I went to the archives and I asked for the, um, the uh, you know, the records, and they gave me this microfiche tape. And it was uh, really horrible, you know, it was impossible to read. It, the, the ink dry was falling off, and I don't know technically what was going on there, but it was impossible to read. So, you know, I asked and they said, well, it's not very common we do this, but they got the white gloves out and the box and brought out, you know, the, the minute book and they turned the page and it fell off, you know. Oh. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the pencil that they used uh, was very uh, difficult to read. It was fading and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, this is serious stuff. So um, I ended up hiring someone, uh, Margaret Sutherland, and uh, she uh, would help and she would go down and she would type, uh, you know, the words out and so then what we found is when we take a picture of it uh, digitally and then we could blow it up on the screen and so that was what, that was a key thing to be able to and get the contrast, you know, mm -hmm. to adjust the contrast. So that was quite successful and uh, so I had a number of the first minutes of 1886, and uh, eventually I kind of ran out of money. So I thought, <laughs> well, maybe uh, I could reach out for volunteers. Well, Margaret said, I I'd like to help. I'm just going to volunteer. So wow, what commitment! And uh, so, but eventually, you know, uh, we I made her the the volunteer coordinator, and then we got other volunteers. So, uh, long story, you know, but uh, we, we're now, uh, we've done almost 5,000 pages. We've had about 50 volunteers. And uh, we are uh, finished 1896, so we've done really uh, 10 years of these minutes. And, and Margaret's tremendous because she will find, and the volunteers will find newspaper articles, they'll find old pictures, and they've linked them up with all of the the documents. So if you go onto the Transcribimus uh, website, you will find, you know, the minutes, you'll find the actual pictures of the handwritten minutes, and then you will find the searchable, uh, you know, digital documents that we've typed up. And so it's, you know, just tremendous, you know, you can see these things. Well, and we'll put the, you can see the website address on the bottom of the frame here. Mm -hmm. um, so if you'd like to go and take a look, and I've, I've gone through it and it's tremendous. Um, now let me ask you a little bit of a political question about this. As far as party politics go, what did you, have you divined any, any ebb and flow in what was going on back then? Well, yeah, the very, first, uh, the very first meeting, all the factions were right there, it's easy to see. You know? <laughs> there was the, the unions, you know, so when the very first um, meeting it was the um, Richard Alexander or the, the manager of the Hastings Mill who was uh, a friend and uh, admirer of James Douglas first governor James Douglas was the head of the Hudson's Bay Company uh, he was a black man partly black uh, married to an Aboriginal woman and so it was this multicultural uh, community aligned with the business community and then it was the um, the white labor unions that uh, were also linked to some of the you know the, the religions were also 
different, you know, it was the dissenting religions there with them and then the more uh, mainline religions with the business. Uh, the British uh, were the, the company uh, people. Uh, they were also, you know, clearly multicultural. Uh, James Douglas with his Aboriginal wife, uh, very pro-Indigenous. Um, and then you had the Americans. They, the, the labor unions at that time were very linked to the U.S. And that's where sort of the racism came. So it's interesting that the racism in British Columbia came from the left. It was the right that uh, was the multicultural. They called them the, the Douglas Conservatives. And then uh, they were opposed by Amor de Cosmos. He, he developed the very first, uh, you know, formal political group called the Reform Association. He was uh, linked with uh, a lot of racism there. The, the, the black uh, community that Douglas had brought up uh, voted for the Jewish, uh, Jewish candidate, Selim Franklin, and barely pushed him over the top, so he got elected. Amor de Cosmos didn't get elected, and he went into this racist rant in his newspaper uh, article the next day. And uh, so, you know, it's uh, interesting to see the dynamics start right away. You know. Well, going back, to, uh, just reflecting on what you originally said about history and going back and coming to Churchill, uh, going back to come forward, uh, when you make uh, the observation about the left being the racist side, you know, you can almost draw that today to the Brexit issue in the UK and a lot of the, the unions not wanting you know people to come in and potentially take their jobs although i think mm -hmm. immigration in general is 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 a, such a plus thing for for most countries and uh, there's so many benefits yeah, yeah. that we get from it but that, that that's quite a contrast um now yeah. how far are you going to go with the project i mean making this stuff available to the public is invaluable it really is i love it you know we are just typing away and these people are incredible and i, I was wondering at the beginning, how do we honor these incredible heroes that are in, in their homes, grinding away on their keyboards, and uh, you know, the, the time and effort they put in, and you cannot reward them. They're not interested. You wanna give them, you know, accolades, immortalize them, put their name on it, no, they'd rather be anonymous. They just like uh, knowledge, they like giving it to the, the, the future. And so the, uh, the things that they're putting together for us is, uh, is remarkable. And I, I, be, I really became a big fan of David uh, uh, Oppenheimer, oh, the yeah. second mayor yeah, yeah. of Vancouver. And that, that's really, when I started doing this, and I, I wanted to know more about him. So uh, really, I wanted sort of five years of of, uh, that was my original goal. I just wanted to have everything about David Oppenheimer. And he was such an amazing guy, a uh, Jewish guy, very philanthropic, a uh, very successful uh, business guy, except he kept over-investing in, in, in things. And when the, uh, you know, he, he uh, donated uh, the wharf, he donated uh, a building for City Hall, you know, he. The, the, you know, he, he uh, donated all this fire equipment. You know, the city burnt down a few months after it was founded. And uh, he ended up being this guy who came in to rescue everybody and, you know, donating all these things. And, and uh, they, you know, were so impressed with him that they asked him to run for city council and they made him mayor, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so many things of Vancouver were started with him, like the, you know, the Stanley Park, you know, uh, the, Hastings Park, you know, p and &E. uh, the very first uh, neighborhood park, you know, these are all things that he uh, initiated and, and then the, the way you'd fund and finance a city, you know, he got us involved with, we're still in the London market, you know, getting our, our funding, uh, financing for the city and, uh, you know, he, nobody wanted to take any debt on and he said, no, this is, we're a city, you know, like you, you've got long-term commitments You've got to borrow and get all your infrastructure in place, and you know. So he led the charge there, and uh, and and you know the very first uh, meeting that he was mayor, uh, they he had to adjudicate basically Kiefer, you know, 
who had hired Chinese workers to, uh, you know, to do a bunch of city work as a contractor. And so this was not allowed under the original city government. And he exonerated him. He said, no, no, he's a contractor. Don't worry about it. So he, you, know, you, could, you could see that he was with Douglas, James Douglas, uh, multicultural. James Douglas would not allow any uh, favoritism uh, by race. And uh, that was, uh, you know, David Oppenheimer went as far as he could. And that was the first thing he did was in allowed uh, the Chinese to continue working as contractors. You know. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. We get these, uh, history can be very politicized for various reasons um, and uh, weaponized in some cases. And you talk about James Douglas and you'll often here in the press, uh, you know, as much as he does or doesn't come up in, in the press and media and that, that, uh, you know, he's blamed for what were called the Douglas Treaties in the south, southern part of Vancouver Island. Mm. Yet, his, his real um, efforts were to try and protect mm. Aboriginal people. And I think you talk Absolutely. about that in one of your videos, don't you? Oh, yeah. No, he, he was chosen by the British government. Uh, you know, Maryvale was the uh, was the head of the colonial department, and uh, they, he, he was a very fierce critic of the British colony model, and he was in Oxford and gave these lectures and was just trashed, you know, the, the British system, and so they made him the head of it. And he brought in the new model, which, you know, he said you cannot allow the democracy to uh, be responsible for the indigenous people. You know, you had to give that to the executive power of the governor and they put James Douglas in charge and he did uh, do incredible things for the native people and uh, recently there was a group of activists that wanted to knock down the, the statue of James Douglas mm -hmm. who was put in the government house in the lieutenant governor's mansion and uh, they wanted they went to the lieutenant governor asking let's let's get rid of that statue you know that old black racist you know I guess and uh, he, uh, the lieutenant governor said, well, you're going to have to ask the lieutenant governor who put it up, which was the first indigenous uh, lieutenant governor, Stephen Point. Point. Yeah. And I mentioned that to Stephen Point, and he, he had a good belly laugh about that, you know, that uh, it was Stephen Point who put up that statue of James Douglas in honor of his approach to the indigenous people. And he thought that guy had it right, you know, and he, he sent out the surveyors to all of the villages and said, you have the, the indigenous people themselves point out the reserve that they want. You know, tell, ask them what land they need. Draw a line around it and then uh, just say you can also preempt land as individuals off reserve, but you're also going to have to compete with other people. And uh, he was told by Lytton, the colonial secretary, he said, uh, you will in attract settlers without regard to nation, without regard to nation. He said this is meant to be a multicultural place as long as they're willing to, you know, uh, live under British law and uh, that they, you should attract everybody. And of course James Douglas went down to San Francisco or sent somebody down and brought up uh, six to eight hundred black people who then came up who were at that time, you know, um, heavily discriminated against. And so they came up and, and uh, James Douglas treated them very well. And they were very successful, you know, they became leaders of the community. And, uh, but after that, you know, when we got democracy actually, <laughs> uh, I'm sad to say, uh, they were less, and once Douglas was gone, that was a problem for them. But uh, it was quite a, an amazing history of our province. Interesting point when you're talking about Governor Douglas and his statue, because statues seem to become have become a focal point for um, all sorts of political um, attention these days. And one of the other, um, well, let's let's talk about Gassy Jack, Jack Dayton. Mm -hmm. um, I, just just a little while ago, his statue was torn down. Uh, claimed to be torn down by the Downtown East Side Association on a, a, a particular march. And, you know, for reasons that 
were presented in the press as, as influencing a lot of people mm-hmm. into believing that he was a certain type of a person. You know, he, and, but, you know, let's talk about him for a little bit because mm. there's some real history that is generally ignored in, in the media. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you've got to remember uh, John Dayton, Gassy Jack, uh, he was actually quite uh, disabled by the time he was, got to New Westminster and he was a steamboat captain, um, uh, often was on crutches. Um, so he had married a Squamish woman and uh, in New Westminster they lived and, and invited in uh, his mother-in-law and his wife's cousin into the home. So right away, as soon as uh, somebody's living with their mother-in-law, they're my hero, you know. I would <laughs> never do it. Uh, no one that I know would live with their mother-in-law, but anybody who will do it, uh, my hat's off, you know. So there he was, living with his mother-in-law and her cousin, who uh, needed, uh, needed a place to stay as well. So uh, now, they, uh, Gassy Jack was very entrepreneurial, he had to really, uh, you know, you really had to, there was no support, no, no government support for anything. So um, basically, they, he figured, you know, there's this mill on the north side of uh, Prairie Inlet, and then you've got the Hastings Mill on the south side, and uh, all these mill workers, and both of the mills were anti-alcohol. So he thought, wow, a bunch of guys with uh, money. Uh, I think I'm going to give my, give a track, give a crack at this. So he bought a big whiskey barrel and uh, the wife's cousin uh, rowed the boat down, uh, you know, a rowboat down with his wife and mother-in-law and uh, they were going to row right around, you know, Point Grey. Uh, But the wind and the storm came up so he stopped at the end of the river and sent a family off to uh, find some food. Uh, they ended up meeting some uh, Musqueam uh, people and went back to there and, uh, and stayed overnight and <laughs> left him in the rain. Uh, he couldn't even get his matches to get his pipe lit or anything. So anyways, uh, when they came back the next morning, they brought food and he forgave them. And uh, so they continued rowing around and then got right at the edge of the Hastings Mill property which is you could not have alcohol on their property. So right at the edge was Carroll and Water. And Maple, Maple Tree Square, he set up, his, his wife and mother-in-law set up a tent, he put a whiskey barrel in the middle, all the, the mill workers uh, sat around and a little, a couple tin cups and they all passed around and enjoyed their first uh, glass of whiskey in many, many years. And so uh, anyways, what happened was, uh, the, they were so pleased about it and they asked him uh, when are we going to be able to do this again and he says well if only I could get a little building here a saloon I would be able to give you whiskey any whenever you wanted and so they all volunteered to make this uh, very first building in Vancouver and that was the, the, the saloon and so he went up on the roof with his Union Jack and said here we are, I'm able to have a, a Squamish wife, I'm able to have a mixed marriage, a multiracial uh, family. I wouldn't be able to do this, or certainly not very easily down south. And uh, so I'm, I'm so happy to be here living under British law. They all sang God Save the Queen, went and had a drink. And uh, so that was the very first. And so what happened in Vancouver is if you ever go to the 100 block where it's zero, Mm-hmm. If you follow the 100 blocks, north, south, east, west, and you'll find the 100 blocks, they all eventually converge down to that pub. And uh, basically that's where the city grew around that, that saloon. And, and the city actually grew around that family too. The first, Vancouver's first family was the Squamish wife and uh, the, uh, the mother-in-law and the cousin so it's interesting that uh, when a few years later his wife uh, was, was very sick and she was dying. And so the mother-in-law the gra- asked her granddaughter to come help uh, with the, the wife as she was uh, dying. And they agreed with the father of the, um, 
the, the, the granddaughter, uh, they all agreed, the family, that she would become Gassy Jack's wife uh, when the, the first wife died. And so that's, you know, that's what everybody gets all upset about, you know, some lecherous uh, old uh, racist or whatever. Absolutely not. Uh, it was an indigenous decision by that family that she should take over from the dying wife. And they claim she was 12 years old. She wasn't 12 years old. We have two documents. The 1881 census say she was 25 in 1881, meaning she was born in 1856, which would have made her between 14 and 15 when she was married, which is not uncommon, and especially in indigenous communities of the time. And even in uh, the non-indigenous uh, communities, Emily Patterson, the first nurse in Vancouver, her daughter got married at 15 as well, you know. So this was a, you know, people are engaged in presentism, the judgment of the past by the values of the present. And it's so interesting to see uh, people judging this indigenous family on their colonial values, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, what's Absolutely. going on there, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so anyways, this was Vancouver's first family, a multicultural, multiracial family. Uh, you know, clearly the grandmother was supported the granddaughter marrying Jack, she was a fan of his. She, he took her in to her home, to his home, and they lived together. And it's interesting, the part that shocked me actually, I just found out recently, was the guy who rowed the boat down the river and you know, helped them uh, and lived in the house of Gassy Jack, became the second husband of his second wife in Squamish. You know. He also became a constable in the North Shore, partly because of the connections of Gassy Jack. You know? mm -hmm. So this was a, a family that was close, and um, you know, it, uh, it, it's a shame that uh, he's been uh, insulted, uh, not only him, but the, the indigenous family, uh, by uh, these people who, like uh, in the old days, very quick to judge. They make immediate discriminatory uh, uh, conclusions about this mixed race family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and you know all the things that they they criticize the old times for discrimination, quick to judge, hypocrisy is right in them themselves. Well, I think your term uh, presentism is so appropriate these days because we've gone. The pendulum swings back and forth always, there's cycles to everything, but we've gone so far over to one side that there's all of these purity tests out there mm. and, and people um, don't actually take the time to do the research, yeah. to yeah. find out what the facts were. And uh, again, with the term presentism, um, to go back and f try and figure out what the values and the morals and the mores were of that time mm -hmm. and how it all worked. Uh, because mm -hmm. as far as I know, as you said, you know, that actually wasn't uncommon to get married at that age in any society in the world, just about. Mm, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's Remember, that's a time when the average lifespan was 35. And uh, almost half of all indigenous children uh, did not make it to adulthood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the reality of yeah. old societies. Where, where do you think the, the path forward lies? then for, for moving forward for, for the segment of the population that does have these concerns and, and, and is, is outraged at a, perhaps a misreading of history, perhaps not, but what, what, what do you, where do you think the path to kind of reconciling these, these gripes lies? How, how do we move forward? Well, I think there uh, needs to be more dialogue, but what we need is we need uh, people who will stand up for British Columbia and Vancouver and defend it. You know, British Columbia is one of the best places in the world. Far, you look at every index of human well-being right at the top. Uh, we're now number one uh, destination for skilled workers from all over the world. Number one. You, they, we just bought, uh, beat out the U.S. now. Clearly, there's something right going on here. Um, you know, there are so many horrible places in the world to live. And to have people, uh, you know, trash talking 
British Columbia mm. yeah. and blaming for racism, we were the least racist of, of any. You know, I mean, there was a time for sure in the early 1900s. And remember, a lot of this came from scientists. Uh, a lot of the, the heads of universities were believed in, in scientific racism. You know, so the average Joe, you know, uh, and Jane, uh, you know, what could they think? They, they, you know, okay, this is obviously scientific. You know, there are some races that are going to, um, uh, you know, to, to excel. And, and remember the, the, the book that really initiated that was a, a, a book called uh, On the Preservation of Favor Favored Races. That was the title of the book. Uh, the, op the other title of it is on the uh, selection of the species uh, by which, Charles which, Darwin. Yeah, which some people absconded with and led to eugenics Yes, in some places yes. with terrible results. Well, a cousin of Darwin, you know, Dalton, uh, you know, uh, was one of the founders of eugenics. And, you know, Charles Darwin himself started going that way uh, in his final book. Uh, so, you know, you, you got to say, remember that in those days, in the early 1900s, if you were born in Britain, you had mandatory school, you had education. People who weren't born and in somewhere else in the world did not have education, almost by definition, you know, so uh, they wouldn't have got through the point system of today, you know. Uh, the Canadian point system would not allow them in, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's, we, gotta, we, we have to understand, you know, that, yeah, it was pretty, uh, you know, we wouldn't tolerate any, a lot of those ideas. I mean, having children married at 14 and 15 wouldn't be acceptable today. But in those days, that was uh, done, it was normal. Yeah, and, and you know, it's this, the whole issue about the statues too in the process. Um, Again, interesting question, interesting response about what's going to happen with the Gassy Jack statue. Should that become a, an issue that we talk about, not just for his sake, but for others too? Because there's some people, you know, around the world that, you know, I remember being down in Seattle and seeing a, a great statue of Lenin in the Fairmont district. And uh, it's a very leftist area in the yeah. States, unusual. But his hands are up and somebody had painted his hands red. Uh. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. But to come back to one of the issues that you've talked about in the past, and that's uh, Matthew Bigby. Yes, and yeah. I understand a few years ago, his statue was also taken down, but in a little bit more of a discreet way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Matthew Bigby is interesting. Uh, the Law Society of BC has also basically uh, said some very terrible things about him. And the guy who stood up for him was a guy named Tom Berger. Tom Berger, who pioneered the indigenous rights land titles in the Canadian law. No one has done anything as close to what Tom Berger has done for indigenous rights. And Tom Berger is the guy who stood up for Matthew Begbie. He said, you got him wrong. You have completely misunderstood and at the same, same time uh, denigrated British Columbia history by uh, these, uh, the, the way you've treated our first Chief Justice who was one of the best we had of the time. He was the most enlightened of anybody. You know, he was the one who uh, threw out the potlatch ban you know, for six years while he was in power in, in, his, uh, in his office. And, and, that, and that was a, a decision. A court yeah. decision that he made, yeah. Yes, yeah, and he uh, he got uh, I think eleven uh, indigenous people, you know, got them appealed so that they wouldn't uh, have the death penalty, and uh, he he was the only one uh, of any major official to stand up for the Chinese in the Royal Commission when they were trying to figure out should we really have any more Chinese immigration, and he stood up for them and uh, said this is all racial jealousy. He said these people are the most, uh, you know, uh, productive and, and law-abiding people. And uh, so, you know, it's interesting to have him, of all people, being, uh, being pilloried. 
Yeah, and, I, and his, his uh, the name a lot of people give him is the hanging judge, which is not really fair, is it? No, they, it, the, the word apparently came from uh, an article, a, a headline called the haranguing judge, because he would harangue the, um, the defendants and the jury, actually, when they weren't making a good decision. Like, there was one uh, American miner that he thought certainly deserved everything he could get, <laughs> and, uh, and his, his colleagues, miners, did not convict him. And so he really gave a, a tongue lashing to the jury, and he was called the haranguing judge, you know, uh, and and that became the hanging judge, and and the the, the real uh, problem for him was with the um, Chilcotin, uh, when when there a group, a small faction of the Chilcotin people, uh, who were not supported by the two main chiefs, uh, Chief Alexis and Chief Anahim. Uh, they uh, killed uh, 19 or some odd uh, uh, road builders, not in Chilcotin territory. Actually, that's a little bit of a uh, you know mistake as well. But um, there was this this terrible situation where they did, uh, and then Chief Alexis, Chief Anaheim uh, were not in favor of this, and they helped to to bring in the. Um, the people that had done this, and uh, you know, this was um, the the jury trial, you know, and so uh, Tom Berger makes the point that this was not his decision. This was the jury's decision. He oversaw the trial. He wasn't happy about the trial. He he had misgivings about it, but you know, there was it was a very emotional time, you know, with uh, the people. They had their bodies mutilated and thrown in the river and uh, you know these were all pretty pretty emotional times and so they were they were uh, guilty they were just de declared guilty by the jury and there is no other option it's it's uh, you know a capital punishment yeah and and um, as I understand it back in that time um, you know, if somebody was found guilty of murder, it was, uh, you were going to be executed. That was the law. That was it, yeah. It wasn't yeah. like you had a lot of choice. Mm -hmm. um, let me move on to one more statue. Mm -hmm. And um, this it was over in Victoria, mm. who um, one of Victoria's former MPs, he was a sta had a statue there for his, the work that he had done uh, during his life, and that was John A. MacDonald. Mm -hmm. McDonald yeah, yeah. actually lost a by-election in one of the elections, or uh, lost his seat in one of the elections in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And so he ran in the by-election in Victoria mm -hmm. and was prime minister. But as, as we know, um, there were some issues with various people complaining about uh, how uh, McDonald's statue outside of the city hall, and it was taken down, and I actually don't even know where it is right now. Mm -hmm. But there was a big... Uh, protest uh, against that. There was a, not not a necessarily a march, but a lot of people spoke up and sent emails in, and it seems like uh, you know only one side of the story is mm. is getting listened to and reacted to these days. What, what's mm. your take on that? Well, he was such an uh, important part of the creation of the country. You know, I, I I think you could say that no one was perfect. I, I don't know the story enough well enough, but you know, uh, I, you know, he had uh, this the U.S. breathing down his neck. Uh, they had just bought Alaska. They were gonna. They wanted British Columbia. They mm -hmm. wanted to take over uh, this area, and uh, which would have been a serious uh, problem for Aboriginal people, uh, certainly. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's really terrible that. Uh, you know that you you look at his life you have to judge it in terms of what was the morals and the you know the values that of that time and he uh, what he did for this country what no one could have done he pulled it together and we are living in uh, the benefits of what he did so you know we we should be respectful of our past uh, we don't have to respect 
everything everybody did. Uh, you know, when people say, you know, well, I wonder if there's something about today that, you know, 40 years or 100 years from now, people would look back at us as a society and just be disgusted with who we were. And boy, if we ever have one a statue of ourselves up there, it's going to be pulled down pretty <laughs> quick. But, you know, and I, I look at, yeah, look at the downtown east side, you know. Here we have people living on the street in a horrible, people living in third world conditions in this great country, you know. And, uh, and we go about our lives. We have 9,000 people dead of a completely preventable overdose problem. And we carry on, you know, like, like it's It's, it's been more deadly than COVID. It's been way more deadly than COVID. You know, the average age of a COVID death is 82 and a half. The average age of a person of an overdose is 40. So every life, every life you lost from an addicted, addicted person, you lost basically 40 more years of life you know, than the average COVID death. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's hard to believe. And, and, you know, the fact that we have people today that are so quick to judge 150 years ago. I mean, like, you know, Romulus did some terrible things. You know, do we not going to change the city of Rome? You know, uh, Paris, you know, the Greek goddess, she did some really bad things. We wouldn't really uh, approve of that. You're going to change Paris? Come on. You know, like the the uh, they eventually may get their own identity. You know, and uh, you know, you think about some of the schools that have been the names have been changed. You know, and my mother went to Begbie School. You know, and she loves that. Uh, she doesn't know who Begbie was, but she, you know, she has this sense of continuity about all the the children that have gone there and has, you know, it, that it's developed its own identity, and. Um, you know, uh, and, and just to also add that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission rejected changing names and taking down statues. They said it smacks of revenge and it can be counter to uh, reconciliation. You know, so, so the woke uh, thing that's going on now is really quick to change names and do these cosmetic things, you know. Uh, but Meanwhile, we got the downtown east side happening, you know. Um, so yeah, you, you, we've been talking about how how history is filled with with um, events and, and practices that we would now probably um, frown upon. But I'm wondering what your opinion is on acknowledging the horrors of the past with without allowing them to to kind of make us self self loathing. Is there any way we can we can move forward and and acknowledge uh, history while, while not becoming too, too, uh, too depressed by it. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Hmm. Yeah, no, uh, it's important to acknowledge and to understand the past and, you know, to, uh, there's lots of things to regret. I mean, you know, I mean, but that's the human history. You know, if you look at uh, uh, the human history, I mean, even before, uh, contact, you know, the, the indigenous people had a lot of slaves, you know, about 15% of the coast were slaves, you know, and very brutal treatment. And it was one of the most violent uh, societies. Uh, archaeologically, they have, you know, there's 10, 15, 20%, even in one case, 30% of bones in the cemeteries have uh, blunt force trauma. You know, these are staggering numbers. Uh, mostly uh, head uh, and also uh, peri fractures on the arms as you're trying to defend yourself from being clubbed. And that was, uh, that was you know, what was going on here. Uh, when, when the contact came, uh, the slavery became illegal because it was illegal in the British Empire in the 1830s. So, uh, I mean, I even talked to one indigenous friend uh, who's a chief. He said his grand great grandmother used to have slaves, you know, and the government agent said, No, you're going to have to let your slaves go, you know. Said, what are you, who the hell are you, you know, you can't take away my slaves, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, people don't r even realize that their slavery was a big part of the coast. 
you know. So, um, you know, so in Vancouver, in fact, there's only one school that uh, is named after a slave owner, uh, and I went to it. Uh, it was my school. And that's what. What's that? Mannequin. Mannequin? Oh, uh, uh, no, McQuinna. McQuinna, sorry, yeah, yes. Keep McQuinna. McQuinna. Yeah, yeah. Keep McQuinna. Yeah, yeah. He had 50 slaves and he had, uh, you know, a couple of white guys that were slaves. Uh, and one of them went and wrote, wrote a book, John Jewett, about the slavery. And, and he killed a number of his slaves. But I don't think you should change Chief McQuinna, you know. I think it's a really important part of our history that we, and we should celebrate the indigenous, the non-indigenous, and, and all these, uh, you know, all of our past, and and I think we should respect the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And when uh, the white guys try to freelance and say, no, I'm going to change the name and take down the statue for reconciliation, that's not true at all. You are going against reconciliation. The commission said that is not reconciliation, but you still get people doing it, and um, you know. Well, and you know, it's interesting because that whole process actually uh, seems to have mobilized or energized the far, far right on the political spectrum yeah, to yeah. counteract. And so we end up with these, these yeah. two confronting extremes that make it really uncomfortable for the they, average. They were absolutely right. The commission was right to say, you start doing that and you're going to create a backlash and you're going to now make things worse. Yeah. So, and you know your comparisons with Rome and, and 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 Paris and other places too. One of my favorite little quotes was Mark Twain, because people always say you know history repeats itself, and Twain said no, it, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Ah, <laughs> very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm gonna let you edit this part because I'm yeah. gonna yeah, yeah, look yeah. at my sheet and see where we're at. You gave us a good quote uh, for the edit point. It'll, it'll transition nicely. There you go. <laughs> Probably have one more question left, or okay, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty long. Okay, now did you want to ask the uh, that last question you were thinking of about the? Oh, you did, I think. Yeah, I asked. Uh, I could. I mean, I yeah, you both, asked both these ones. Okay. We we were both interested in kind of the influence okay. of American. If you want to do that one, or if you no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you can ask the last question. No, nope. right. you wanted to. Go for it. Wait, which one? Which one? <laughs> well, I think I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Oh, I mean, if you had a, a, a one in mind, I. Okay. Yes, ask, ask the I've last got one in mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, so Sam, you've got several projects going. We t we we started off talking about them. What's what's next? What's what also do you have? in your brain there that you're looking at and saying, saying this is something else that needs to be done? Well, I really am um, trying to promote a Chinook jargon. It was the old trade language. And it was a beautiful language in that, um, you know, it's a, it's a pidgin language. It's many languages all mushed together. And uh, it's uh, really interesting because Generally, in pidgin languages, the vocabulary is contributed by the dominant language, the prestige language, and the grammar is, is by the non-prestige language. So people are trying to attain the prestige culture. And usually in pidgin language, it's a European language, but not in Chinook jargon. In Chinook jargon, it's the Aboriginal language that is prestige and dominant. So it, right embedded in that language is this idea that the Europeans were, knew who were the power, who had the power. It was the uh, indigenous people, the Chinook people mostly. And so they were trying to, you know, even English borrowed words would be properly spoken with a Chinook accent. You know, so uh, this, Basically, it was the lingua franca of the West Coast. And uh, indigenous people, non-indigenous people, they all spoke it. It was very simple language, you know, five, six hundred words, uh, two, three, four hundred even, you'd, you'd be fluent. You'd be able to get yourself around and, you know, survive. So uh, we're discovering all these old treasure troves of, uh, you know, of Chinook writing. I went out to the Quebec, there's a monastery there that had a 
a trunk full of Chinook writings. And, uh, and then we just discovered this uh, 1941 aluminum cylinder recording of 10 hours of an Aboriginal guy speaking Chinook jargon. And I've been going through it. I've already translated two hours of it. I've got eight more to go, you know. But uh, to find these treasures there, and we now know how it was spoken, and we can revive that language. So uh, it's a kind of a crazy idea for me, but uh, I'm wanting to do that. I, I think that's quite admirable. We, we're potentially losing so many lang indigenous mm -hmm. languages so quickly mm -hmm. as you know, people pass mm -hmm. away that are really the keepers of these languages. Mm -hmm. And somehow, somewhere, as you're t doing yeah. with the Chinook language, we've, we've got to get this stuff recorded and maybe yeah. even reintroduced a little bit mm -hmm. with, with some of the communities uh, in British Columbia. Yeah, there was a newspaper called the Kamloops Wawa, written in Chinook, but it written with a special uh, it was based on a French shorthand, but adjusted. And it, there it started in the 1890s. And, uh, you know, so it's interesting because some of those old documents talk about the Kamloops Residential School. Yeah, yeah. At the very beginning, 1890s. And it's interesting that at that time, they were teaching Aboriginal languages in the school. You know, so this idea that it was always taking away the languages not in that particular date at that time. It was run by the Oblates and they were very focused on preserving languages. And they actually taught Chinook jargon in it and uh, one of the other languages. Well, I, you know, I for one am looking forward to um, bringing out a lot of this information that we're waiting for right now about all those, those things mm -hmm. with the residential schools and hopefully with the reconciliation with the Pope and. The, uh, some of our Aboriginal leaders, uh, we can make some real progress into yep. yes. really uh, finding out what happened with a lot of this stuff. Yes. And, uh, yeah, that has to yeah. be told. Sure. Well, I th th thank you so much, Sam. I hope this is potentially the first of many little get-togethers we can have. And uh, your knowledge and your, your enthusiasm uh, for history and politics are, are really quite encouraging in this day and age when most people just like to jump on a bandwagon. You're <laughs> obviously out there doing the research and bringing something back with, with the, uh, you know, the, the uh, digitization project, the Chinook language, and all the other things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for being it. interested. Thank you.